Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our Wound Exudate Management webinar, What Is Your Dressing Telling You? My name is Jenny Pearson. I'm an Education Officer for the Primary Health Network. Before we go any further, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we're meeting on today and pay respect to Elders past, present and emerging. I'm coming to you from Armidale in northern New South Wales, which is on Anawan land. Um, the webinar is being recorded and will be available in our library on our website. You will also uh, be issued a certificate of attendance um, in about a week's time. Um, at the end of the, the webinar, uh, evaluation will pop up. Um, I would love it if you could just take about a minute to fill it in because that's all it will take you. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in the question box. We have Danielle and Georgina here from Hartman's today that will be answering any questions. Hartman, uh, we are running this uh, webinar along with Hartman's. Uh, we couldn't do it without them. Uh, and it's a great collaboration. Um, our speaker today um, is Melinda Brooks. Melinda is a nurse practitioner and a credentialed advanced wound practitioner. Uh, Melinda has worked in wound management for more than 25 years in a variety of set settings from the Victorian Adult Burns Unit to community nursing, research and lecturing in wound care. As a nurse practitioner in wound management in private practice, Melinda focuses on aged care, community and offers consultancy and education. Co-founding Wounds Are Us in 2016, Melinda delivers wound management education to clinicians in Melbourne. Melinda has been actively presenting at a state and national conferences and thrives on teaching others about the importance of holistic wound care. Melinda has been integral with her con contributions and commitment to Wound Australia over many years. All right, well, I think that's all that you need to hear from me. Um, I'll hand over to Melinda, thank you. Great, thanks so much. Thanks for the introduction. So welcome everybody. Um, so the title for today's webinar is Exudate Management, What Is Your Dressing Telling You? So again, I would like to acknowledge um, that the presentation is being held on the lands of the Wurundjeri people and I wish to acknowledge them as traditional owners. I'd also like to pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be listening today. Just a disclaimer that whilst WoundWise endeavours to cover a wide range of wound care products on the market, it's impossible to include everything uh, in the scope of this webinar today. And also due to affiliations with other companies and organisations, there may be perceived or actual conflicts of interest, but these will always be managed in the public's best interest. So a big thank you to Hartman for asking me to present today. Um, we've been working on this for uh, quite a few weeks now. Uh, so hopefully you'll all get a, you know, a, a little bit out of this um, that will enhance your clinical practice. The learning objectives are to understand the role of exudate in the wound healing process, to describe how excessive exudate can impact wound healing, to recognise the visual characteristics and the clinical signs of exudate, and provide rationales for selecting the most appropriate wound dressings when we think about the level of exudate that's coming out of a wound and what the wound healing goals actually are. So if we stop and think about wound healing environments and balance, life is all about balance and so too is managing wound exudate. And depending on the, the clinical environment that you're working, that can be quite tricky, especially if you're not with the patient on a um, for a prolonged period of time throughout the day. If you're in a clinic or other situation where you're seeing them intermittently, managing wound exudate um, can be very, very tricky. So trying to get the balance can be that um, a challenge for us all, but we also need to ensure that we do get it right and aim for the best outcomes for the patient. So do we just manage exudate or do we try to heal a wound through that most wound healing environment as quickly as possible? So we are trying to, trying to heal the wound. It should be a moist environment. I always refer up to Goldilocks, not too wet, not too dry. We want to get that exudate level just right. So wound exudate, um, there are some informal terms used to describe it, such as wound fluid, wound drainage. Um, a whole range of words can be used, especially by the patient where they may not be aware of the technical terms we use to define wound exudate. 
But in relation to the World Union Wound Healing Consensus document of 2019, exudate is best defined as exuded matter, especially the material composed of serum, fibrin and white blood cells that does escape into the superficial lesion or wounded area or the area of inflammation. So wound exudate is really important. It supports healing by providing that ultimate moist wound healing environment when we're trying to heal. It, it's often a bit of a different story when we're looking at um, wounds that are not aiming to heal, where it's more of a conservative or palliative approach. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on. It also supports healing by allowing for the transfer of immune mediators and growth factors across that wound bed. We need growth factors to stimulate angiogenesis. It acts as a medium for the migration of tissue repairing cells across the wound bed tissue as well. It does supply the essential nutrients. So we know that in order for the body to heal, um, it needs good protein and good kilojoules for uh, granulation tissue to develop through that cellular metabolism process. It does promote the separation of damaged and non-viable tissue through the process of autolysis. Um, and if all of that is in equal balance and play, then, then the wound should heal. So this is a really great wound balance concept that has um, been um, identified and written about in, again in, in a white paper in Wounds International this year that looks at clinical practice balance, patient care balance and wound balance. So from a clinical practice balance perspective, addressing all the challenges um, that clinicians and patients have, that can be limited resources, um, unable to obtain the dressings they want, cost can be a factor, they can't simply afford to get the right dressings to manage the exudate. Um, clinical decision and practice uh, in, the in the continuity of care as well. You know, I often get uh, told by some patients in the community that I have a different nurse every day doing the dressing, they all have different ideas and therefore the dressing regime can be uh, altered. I always recommend to my patients that we give any dressing regime at least a two week chance to see, it, are we seeing signs of improvement and signs of healing? If not, why not? What do we need to go back and reassess? Realistic time balance in daily practice, and that can be quite a challenge. We're all quite time poor. Uh, so ensuring we do have time to do the care properly is important. I always say to, to nurses that I'm teaching, doing a dressing might take a minute, but doing good wound care does take time. Patient care balance. So making sure it is a patient-centred assessment and diagnosis. Every person is different and therefore every wound that we try to help with is different. Patient concordance. This is probably one of my biggest challenges that I find uh, with some of my patients that I will present to them ideas about my assessment and recommendations about their wound, it's their wound, not mine, um, but they choose for whatever reason not to accept that or they feel they can't accept that um, due to their own personal choices and lifestyle factors. So therefore, at the end of the day, I um, often say to them, in my opinion, without implementing best practice recommendations, healing may not be realistic due to patient choices. The balance of patients' quality of life, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this uh, further on and measuring those outcomes as well. From a wound balance perspective, we're looking at uh, the shift in biomarkers, and I'll explain that a little bit further. Normalising and maintaining that healing trajectory, and we know that a lot of the research that's been done over the years has discussed you're looking for a 25 to 30 percent reduction in wound size within the work first four to six weeks of that wound developing in order to for that to replicate um, improvement in that wound. Managing the extra date, of course, and early identification and intervention. So certainly when I go and see a patient, if potentially they've had that wound for three months or six months and that patient hasn't been referred earlier, I say, why wasn't, why weren't they referred? Um, we should be getting on top of any delayed healing as quickly as we possibly can. So let's look at the role of extra day in wound healing. So the wound healing physiology is a really complex process. There is so much going on, and this is a simplified um, chart showing the four overlapping phases of wound healing. Starting with hemostasis, knowing that the fibrin clot will plug the side of the injured vessel fairly quickly within minutes. Certainly those uh, people who are on anticoagulants or antiplatelet drugs, that coagulation process may look, be a little bit slower. We will then see inflammation, the body's immune response to fighting infection with a whole range of monocytes, which then become mature macrophages, 
within the next three days or so. So knowing when that wound has occurred is absolutely vital in your questioning of a patient with a new wound. Was it a couple of days ago? Was it a week ago? Is there inflammation? Is it the normal inflammatory response or is it potentially signs of infection? So once the inflammation settles around day three to four, we want to see granulation tissue building from the bottom up for these wounds healing through secondary intention. The granulation tissue will build through the process of angiogenesis while you have your myofibroblasts uh, pulling the, the, the walls of the uh, wound in as well to aid in that wound contraction. And then once your granulation tissue has reached the level of the skin, then the body will know that we need to seal that wound uh, or put a roof on the wound with your uh, epithelial cells that will contract across the top of that wound. So all of that will happen in a lovely moist wound healing environment. I'm still surprised how many of my patients tell me it's got a scab on it and scab's good, it means it's healed. The principles of moist wound healing, as we know, go back to 1962 and George Winter's research uh, on wounded pigs. So we do need to be mindful that that moist wound healing is what we're really looking for to get this wound healed as quickly as possible. So let's talk a little bit more about biomarkers and wound balance. So biomarkers are actual objective medical signs used to measure the state of a disease or the effects of treatment. Using uh, useful in clinical practice, they do provide a measurable way of measuring, are we getting healing um, rather than just uh, subjectively looking at the wound itself. So wound biomarkers should really be considered by all clinicians to assess that journey of wound healing in order for us to be making those appropriate clinical decisions uh, in collaboration with the patient about how we can get that wound to progress further. So let's look a little bit more at biomarkers that may affect wound balance in healing. So certainly MMPs, and through the research done, it's been identified that MMP2 and MMP9 are the raised inflammatory markers that are present in chronic wound fluid. Um, so that increase in MMP level uh, is what is stalling wound healing in the inflammatory phase in chronic wounds. The last days from polymorphonuclear granulocytes as well can also be a biomarker that we can measure. And a lot of these measurements are, cannot physically be done by us in a day-to-day -day practice in the clinical setting. This is often need to be done um, through the lab, which can be a little bit tricky. Growth factor inactivation and matrix destruction. So growth factors will be inactive when there's heightened level of inflammatory markers such as your MMPs. Um, the absence of local inflammation, and we know that in that first three to four days, we need the body's immune response to uh, munch up the debris and reduce that risk of infection from happening. So we might not necessarily get that um, if we've got heightened levels of MMPs. Therefore, there won't be uh, granulation tissue developed through the process of angiogenesis, and we won't see that epithelial cell migration across the top of the wound as well. We'll also affect nutrient and oxygen um, deficiency also. So MMPs, as I've said, are key biomarkers. During the inflammatory phase, we know that they add in the removal of bacterial um, a bacteria and also damaged extracellular matrix. So that will just sit there that will be munched up by um, the MMPs. The proliferative phase, it aids in the degradation of capillary basement membrane um, for angiogenesis and also that migration of the epithelial cells. During the matur maturation or the remodeling phase, it will aid in the contraction of scar tissue. And in that remodeling of the scar tissue where that collagen that has been developed in the first uh, few months post healing does take up to the scientists tell us around two years for that scar tissue and the collagen to gain a maximum of 80% tensile strength. So trying to enhance um, and protect that scar tissue through uh, potentially protective dressings can go a long way to preventing a wound breakdown in the initial uh, post healing phase. So we do get quite an imbalance of, of chemicals and cytokines in the wound fluid when we see delayed healing, and that's that increase in the MMPs. That also, they also tend to find there's a decrease in the TIMPs as well. So things are not in the balance we're aiming for. So let's look at acute and chronic wounds, and um, I'll go to definition shortly, but we know that um, 
wound exudate that's been studied in the lab um, certainly has shown those elevated levels. It's not just the wound itself that we worry about, it's also the peri-wound skin around the wound. And you know, we do define the peri-wound skin now as up to 20 centimetres beyond the wound margin, not just that four centimetres. So we need to be looking at the whole area. We do need to look at identifying the factors that could be delaying healing early. So what is going on with the patient? Need to look at those systemic and local factors, which we'll talk about shortly. And delayed healing can be seen as early as two weeks post wounding. It can be very, very early. Um, and we'll talk about biofilms and bacterial load a little bit more shortly. So other factors that may delay healing, certainly the general health status of the patient. Um, I, I had an email a couple of days ago to go and see a patient who had a pressure injury on his heel. He's in an aged care facility and he was healing really well. Uh, and they emailed me to say, look, the wound's really deteriorated. We're quite concerned. So I was planning to see him this afternoon. And I got an email this morning to say he actually passed away last night. And certainly as a person's health status is declining and the body is shutting down, we often see that initially in their wounds, particularly on the feet and sacrum. Uh, so with this gent, I think the deterioration in his wound is certainly the major contributed by his uh, delayed, his, sorry, um, poor health and his declining health. Certainly medical conditions that we look at, things like autoimmune conditions, inflammatory diseases, uh, diabetes is always the first one that people talk about. When with diabetes, it certainly depends on how well controlled they are. Uh, are they on insulin or oral or hypoglycemics? Um, is their blood sugar levels reasonable and within limits? And you know, I sort of laugh when I, I say, yep, yeah, their blood sugar's fine at 16 or 18 this morning and that's okay. I'm, not really okay. We should be really in for that tight glycemic control uh, because we know that otherwise the body's going to be in a heightened state of inflammation. Other conditions like anemias, malignancies uh, can also have a big impact on wound healing. So medications, I've already mentioned antiplatelets and anticoagulants, certainly corticosteroids, um, especially in that initial inflammatory phase will all impact on healing. Systemic and local factors. So systemically, we're looking at things like nutrition. The body needs the good kilojoules and protein, like I said, to aid in wound healing and the development of that granulation tissue. However, if a person is not eating and drinking as well as they could, let alone getting extra kilojoules and protein they need in their diet, then that will have a big impact. Um, and certainly looking at things like arginine supplements can be very beneficial. In relation to supplementation of vitamins and minerals, uh, generally we would need to do a blood test to look at their vitamin and mineral levels before we supplement. The evidence does tell us that there's no benefit to healing if they're not deficient in those areas. So we really should check that first. Locally, we're looking at things like uh, pressure, shear, friction and moisture on the skin that can potentially lead to breakdown as well. The right dressing, the wrong dressing, you know, is it promoting that optimum environment? Is it too wet? Is it too dry? The risk of infection and bio burden. So this can often come back to um, hygiene practices of the person with the wound, um, particularly if they live in an environment where the wound is not always covered, the dressings are coming off, or with a psychological status. A lot of my patients that I see do have a cognitive impact or dementia in which case they're constantly taking their dressings off and exposing the wound to the environment, which can lead to increase of infection as well. So all of those factors can certainly have a really big uh, part to play in delayed healing. So chronic wound is defined as wounds that fail to proceed through the normal phases of healing in an orderly and timely manner. So they do basically get stuck in that initial inflammatory phase. And this definition has changed in recent years. Uh, prior to that, we used to say a chronic wound is one that heals within four to, sorry, is one that doesn't heal within four to six weeks and an acute wound should heal within four to six weeks. Yet now they're talking about the wound progressing through the phases. So it is going back to that physiology of healing. And it's important for us as clinicians to remember that when we're doing our wound assessment at each dressing change. So we do need to be alert for any red flags, any signs of concern every time we do a um, attend to a wound assessment and a wound dressing change. So like I said, a dressing can be done by anyone. If you take a dressing off and put a dressing on, 
but wound assessment needs to be holistic and the clinician needs to look at everything going on with that person and they also need to assess the wound itself. So early identification will certainly enhance that wound healing trajectory. So what are you really seeing in wound exudate? We know that exudate is produced and its highest, le highest levels is normally during that inflammatory phase of healing, that initial phase. It will provide the optimal moist wound environment. It will allow for those transition of growth factors uh, and it will aid in supplying those nutrients as well. So there's lots of things found in exudate and I think we're always quite um, surprised by what we can see and types of exudate can look so different depending on the wounds that you're looking at. So yes, there's water and this will prevent the tissues drying out. There is fibrin, fibrin which does aid in clotting, especially in that it, when the trauma has initially happened to the skin and we want that fibrin clot to plug the side of the injured vessel. It contains glucose, which we know is a source of cellular energy to help in the um, process of granulation tissue. It has immune cells, Therefore, the immune defense and aid in the growth factor production, we need the growth factors there in the right balance for the wound trajectory to continue. Platelets will also aid in, in clotting as well. Proteins do aid in the transport of other molecules and really do have good immune effects in the body. The growth factors, we usually have pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory uh, growth factors, which should stimulate cellular growth, again, in the right levels. Proteases, which will aid in autolysis and cell migration. It does have metabolic waste, so that's why excess exudate on the wound bed should be removed and cleansed well at each stressing change. Microorganisms are always going to be there. We are not sterile beings. Our wounds are not sterile. So you're always going to have a degree of microorganisms. And I commonly find when we talk about wound infection, and I ask the question of clinicians, do you swap, wash your wounds before you swab? I would have to say about 80% of the people I ask say, no, they don't wash their wounds. They, they're wanting to take the swab from the wound exudate sitting on top of the wound bed. And, you know, I say to them, well, it's not going to be very helpful because we're going to have microorganisms sitting there, but it's going to be the mixed flora and the organisms that we live with in harmony. So when we are taking that wound swab, we do need to try and remove any slough or non-viable tissue from the wound bed. And we do need to try and get that swab into the granulation to isolate the microorganisms, causing the spreading, infect, spreading infection, because that's why we've swabbed in the first place. And also uh, there's gonna be debris with the proteases and the devitalized tissue there. So certainly wound exudate can increase due to potentially trauma. Again, trauma to the skin can in, uh, increase that inflammatory response, which leads to an increase in exudate. Certainly infection and the types and the, uh, the level of microorganisms in the wound will lead to an increase. Uh, certainly some medications, the presence of edema. So we know that someone with a wet, weepy leg due to venous insufficiency, lymphedema, if that um, edema is not controlled, then it's so hard to try and manage that extra day without compression, without appropriate super absorbing dressings. So edema in the wound can be a major problem. Underlying medical conditions, so lymphedemia, cardiac failure, renal impairment, uh, they're some of the conditions that can certainly have a big impact on increasing exudate levels. Certainly I know when I see patients who are in uh, acute heart failure, their legs are, represent, I always think, bubble wrap, especially the lower limbs. Their skin is super fragile and they'll have quite severe pitting edema. And if you touch the skin, you're at risk of breaking it because their skin's often so fragile. So as the heart is failing, you do often see that um, follow on effect. So let's look at the types of exudate. And I think a lot of clinicians have different names or terminology for the types of exudate they're seeing. It is good that we're all using the same um, wording and the same terminology, especially in the same workplace when we're charting on wound charts. Otherwise, things get quite confusing. So we know cirrus is fairly clear, amber, straw-coloured, it's quite thin, 
And that's quite a normal type of XGHC through that inflammatory phase and will decrease in amounts through the proliferative phases. And by the end of the proliferative phase, uh, there shouldn't be any exudate because the wound will have healed. Uh, it can increase when there's signs of infection and I've talked about the, the medical condition that may cause that as well. So serous sanguinous um, is quite a clear light pink colour, pink to reddish colour. Um, again, fairly thin, but usually a bit thicker than water. And again, quite normal during the inflammatory and proliferative phases. The pinkish colour is really due to the red blood cells uh, breakdown in that fluid. And we certainly can see it postoperatively, postoperatively, but we would expect that to ease off and become more serious as that wound's improving and going through the phases. Sanguinous is quite red. Thin and watery, again, due to the presence of the red blood cells. And that can indicate there's been some new formation of red blood cells through angiogenesis or potentially disruption of the, bread, of the blood vessels. That's uh, the red blood cells have leaked into the fluid. It can also be associated with hypergranulation. Seropurulent, we're starting to get more thicker, more cloudy at this point in time, still quite thin, um, but it does contain some pus. It can be due to some liquefying necrotic tissue that's breaking down in the body due to autolysis. And it may be a, a signal that there's some uh, a bacterial load starting to replicate, starting to cause a response in the host and therefore delayed healing. Fibrinus is quite cloudy, again, quite thin and watery, uh, cloudy due to the presence of fibrin strands in that fluid. And also it can indicate inflammation with or without infection. Purulent, we're certainly getting thicker, more soup-like. So whenever I, I say to people when I'm teaching, we're looking at wound fluid, what we're looking for in the progression of that wound is it might be thick and heavy to start with like a soup, maybe a really creamy soup. By the end of it, I want it to look almost like water in that cirrus. Um, and looking at wound exudate level and type alone, if I'm looking at a wound chart and say tracking that wound over the past month, looking at level and type of exudate can tell me everything I need to know about that wound. I wouldn't need to look at any other parameters uh, in relation to the wound progression because that alone will tell me if things are progressing or not. Um, also in purulent, there's some neutrophils, inflammatory cells, bacteria, can be some uh, liquefying the chronic tissue. Certainly will indicate that there's uh, a, a, a bacterial load and a level of infection we need to address. Certainly if you've got that lovely purulent bright green colour, it's generally related to pseudomonas and will generally have an odour. Um, we do need to treat all of those signs and isolate the microorganisms with our wound swab so we can get the right antibiotic treatment and follow our antimicrobial stewardship guidelines. Hemopurulent is reddish, milky and quite opaque. It's usually quite thick and that's just that mixture of blood and pus um, in quite an established infected wound. And hemorrhagic is quite red with opaque and thick. And again, due to that red blood cell, we're seeing that red color. So in assessing wound exudates, start by assessing the person first. So holistic assessment is vital. Assessing at each dressing change. Like I say, a simple dressing change could be done by anyone, but a wound assessment needs to be done by a trained clinician, looking at everything that's going on, the amount, the type, the consistency, signs of odor, the effectiveness, has that wound dressing that's been on it for a day or five days been effective? Examine the old dressing and I cannot emphasize this enough. If I took this off a wound, then I'm worried. So this is certainly, um, you know, taking that dressing off, examining it, you, you will smell it. Um, you're not gonna weigh it. We'll talk about wound measure, um, exudate measurement in a moment, but you do need to have a feel, is it heavy? How long has that dressing been on for? What else is going on with the person and the wound? And that will tell you a lot of valuable information before you think about what you're gonna do next. Ask the patient the right questions. Use positive language. Try not to say, oh, that stinks. <laughs> uh, it's not gonna go down well. So certainly uh, asking the person, have they got any increased pain? Can they smell an odour? Um, you know, what has been concerning them about the, the wound and the wetness? And often with a, a dressing like this, it, they will probably complain of it feeling quite wet. So we do need to change what we're doing there. So wound exudate score, I think, you know, wound exudate is still quite a subjective assessment by clinicians. There's a few uh, various 
scores that can be used. A lot of uh, nurses, especially in documentation, will write one plus, two plus, three plus um, in relation to minimal, moderate and heavy. This one developed by Falanga in the year 2000 looks at um, wound score one, two or three and looks at the extent of control. So whether it's full, partial or uncontrolled, the amount of exudate, whether it's quite minimal or none, whether it's moderate or heavy, and then the dresser requirements put in there as well. So for a very minimal or no extra date, you really don't need absorptive dressings. You would be looking for a dressing that will uh, contain a minimal amount of extra date, ensuring a moist wound environment, and it should progress towards healing. If it's a moderate level, then maybe you're looking at a dressing change every two to three days. If it's very heavy, then normally you just need to do it daily or sometimes twice a day. So how can uh, excess exudate actually impact on wound healing? Excessive exudate can be just as harmful at times as a uh, very little amount of exudate when we haven't got that moist wound healing environment. So it can certainly cause leakage on the body and with gravity, that leakage strips and falls down to the feet. So particularly on a lower leg wound, it can cause lots of embarrassment and discomfort for the person can have a huge impact on their psychological status, on their social um, outings, on seeing family, on eating meals with other people, all sorts of things. Uh, so we do need to assess for that and try and manage it. Soiling of clothes and regular washing. Certainly increased risk of infection if you've got that wet exudate sitting on the wound and the skin. Pain and discomfort can be huge factors for the person. With a heavier increase in exudate, you're going to have a loss of proteins and electrolyte imbalance. So we do need to bear in mind, particularly with things like venous leak ulcers, where they can lose a lot of exudate if they're not in compression or elevating or doing uh, exercises, that we do need to keep an eye on their total protein and their albumin levels as well. It can cause significant maceration to the peri wound skin and ultimately can lead to an increase in wound size. So the types of wounds we're really looking at are the VLUs, perhaps uh, to hist surgical wounds, malignant fungating tumours, especially as they are um, increasing in size and worsening, burns, especially again in that initial phase, and depending on the depth of burn will depend on how much exudate's coming out. Uh, inflammatory ulcers, such as um, underlying potentially a pyoderma or a vasculitis or any other type of inflammatory conditions and donor sites as well. So if there's not enough exudate coming out, that will certainly delay autolytic debridement because the environment is just too dry. It can be trauma to the wound bed on dressing removal, which can cause a lot of pain and can cause bleeding. Dry wound edges will prevent epithelial contractions. So um, during COVID, when I was doing a little bit more telehealth, you know, I'd be uh, looking at the patient through my system and advising the nurse on what to do. And I always remember uh, a nurse who was um, cleaning around a wound that had quite a dry crust around the wound edge. I think it was a heel pressure injury. And I was always wanting to get into the camera, into the, the laptop to have a look and do it for him. But I said, if you can just get your faucets, see if you can lift off that little bit of dry tissue from around the wound edge. If you can remove that gently without pain or trauma, then you will get your epithelial contraction. And he did it beautifully. He said, oh, that was so good. I'm so happy I did it. So, you know, it's a good sense of achievement for the, for the nurse and it was great for the patient because we were trying to accelerate that wound healing without pain for them. So certainly in, in uh, wounds such as ischemic or arterial ulcers, there's very minimal exudate normally. And certainly neuropathic diabetic foot ulcers, they can be quite minimal as well. It depends on the wound. So let's look at some of the barriers to healing we may face in practice. So certainly systemic, I've been through some of these already. Uh, venous insufficiency is a huge one if it's not controlled with appropriate compression, elevation uh, and exercise. Uncontrolled diabetes, nutritional deficiencies I've mentioned. Inflammation, carcinogenesis or malignancies and arterial insufficiency as well. And, you know, I'm not a vascular surgeon, so if my patient has arterial uh, insufficiency or peripheral arterial disease, it can be very um, difficult to try and achieve healing and healing may not be realistic for that person unless they're open to the options of vascular intervention. From the local level, we've talked about the increase in the MMPs, growth factor inactivation, um, they'll stop uh, producing growth factors when you have got that heightened level of MMP. 
reduce local inflammation, there won't be angiogenesis or production of granulation tissue or epithelialization. Nutrient and oxygen deficiency can occur as well, and there could potentially be ongoing trauma. So for normal wound healing, we're really looking for that wound to progress through the normal phases in a timely manner for that person. So let's look at choosing the right dressing for extradate levels. No one dressing is going to be the answer to all kinds of wounds. So once we've done our assessment, looked at the type and amount of extradate, talked to the person, then we can discuss dressings that might be suitable just for them. So for wound bed preparation, um, we know that we often refer to the time concept, looking at tissue debridement, removal of that non viable tissue. So making sure we are cleaning the wound really well and thoroughly. So not just the wound bed itself, but the skin around the wound. Uh, look at looking for signs of infection and managing that fire burden, whether that might be through the use of topical antiseptics, uh, using bore swabs, using monofilament debridement pads to remove slough from the wound bed tissue trying to get that moisture balance just right and looking for signs of epi epidermal advancement from the edges. So you're looking for that lovely pink tissue starting to come across or epithelial islands. In relation to debridement, so ensuring we can remove the necrotic and the non-viable tissue as best as possible. And certainly there are lots of methods of debridement. You know, I say to nurses, do you debride? And a lot of them say to me, no, I don't, I'm not allowed. But when you put a dressing on the wound, promoting autolytic debridement, it's a form of debridement. You might use your forceps or your gauze swabs to remove non-viable tissue off the wound bed. It's a method of debridement. It's the debridement through conservative sharp wound debridement with a blade or scissors or sharp instrument that not all, start, not all clinicians are trained in. And that's certainly that needs to be done by an expert. If we can remove that non-viable tissue as quickly as possible, we are promoting a better environment for that wound to granulate up. Then extradate management, you can see there, there's lots of pads on that uh, leg of that lady, all quite wet and soaked. So if it, the dressings are left on too long, the, the dressings aren't absorbent enough, then the wrong amount, the wrong place and the wrong com composition of extradate will have a detrimental effect. Um, and in relation to, uh, to dressing selection, do we need an absorbent product or do we need a super absorber? And I'll talk about SAP dressings shortly. So factors affecting dressing selection, certainly the patient's needs and preferences. I'll never forget years ago, I saw a lady in her late 90s who had several um, skin tears on her legs. And I was trying to educate her about the use of silicon foam dressings that are quite gentle to the skin. And she said, no, 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 I've tried everything. I'm allergic to everything. There's only one dressing that works for me. And I said, okay, what's that? And she showed me, and it was a very tough dressing um, that is brought at a supermarket that is really traumatic to the skin. And I just went, oh, gosh. And I thought to myself, there's no way I'm going to change her mind despite this education. But, you know, at the end of the day, I try and educate as best I can. And ultimately, it's their choice what they would like to do. The tissue type on the wound bed. So dressing selection often changes from beginning to end of that wound's history because the wound bed tissue changes. The volume and type of exudate also, the wound depth, whether there's an, an odour present, the level of wound infection, I'll talk about that a little bit more shortly when I talk about biofilm. Cost and availability can be a big issue depending on where you are working. You know, for years we've tried to lobby for wound dressings to be subsidised by the government, but we still haven't quite got there yet. But, you know, a lot of my patients certainly say, I'm really sorry, but I can't afford to buy 10 of those at dollar dressings. I'm on a pension or, you know, I've got budget uh, restrictions. It's really difficult because you want to give them the best care possible. And, of course, clinicians' preference. So certainly as clinicians, we should be trying to, have a broad open mind. And I guess that will depend on where the clinician's working. I'm lucky I had the luxury of being in private practice and I can choose any dressing I want most of the time. However, if I go into aged care, they'll have a, a basket of goods and they're the dressings that we need to choose. From. So when we talk about biofilm, I'm gonna explain a little bit more, but we really need to be taking that step up, step down approach to biofilm. So the choice of dressing will vary as the, um, signs of infection come and go in a wound. So let's talk about that a little bit more. 
So biofilm is to, um, are aggregate microorganisms that have unique characteristics and enhance tolerance to treatment and the host defences. So wound biofilms are associated with impaired wound healing and show signs of chronic inflammation. There's so much research being done over the last 20 years or so in relation to biofilms, but the scientists tell us they still know very little. How they develop in acute and chronic wounds is unknown. So I always give the example, when you wake up in the morning, you've got slime in your mouth and on your teeth, you'll brush your teeth and your mouth feels clean. While you've been sleeping at night, a biofilm is actually developed in your mouth, which are basically little colonies of microorganisms that build and build and, and multiply and replicate. Now, these little micro uh, colonies are quite small and invisible to the naked eye. They're microscopic. We cannot see them. But once you clean your teeth and disturb the biofilm, you feel clean again. So that's similar to the biofilm that's developing in wounds. There's often multiple types of organisms uh, in these biofilms, uh, and they often do have an increased tolerance to antimicrobial treatments. I think we're very lucky with the selection of dressings we have available here in Australia, at least. Um, that a lot of the antimicrobial solutions, as in antiseptics as well as dressings, um, so far haven't shown any resistance to uh, most of the biofilms that we're seeing. So it's important we do use them for the correct amount of time and not overuse them where potentially resistance can develop. So in, a, in order to disturb a biofilm and try to reduce it from reforming, it comes back to basics, and that is really good wound bed cleansing optimising the wound environment um, and promoting comfort for the person. So the criteria indicative of potential biofilm in a wound, certainly failure of appropriate antibiotic treatment. Um, and again, that's where it comes back to the importance of swabbing and making sure we are identifying the organisms to get the most specific narrow spectrum antibiotic. Recalcitrant to appropriate antimicrobial treatment. The recurrence of delayed healing on the cessation of antibiotics. So that's something to bear in mind as well. Sometimes you'll you'll change from say saline and an inert dressing to an antiseptic and an antimicrobial product with some antibiotics. Then as soon as that stops, the wound goes backwards. So that's where we need to look at that step up, step down approach to biofilm. We would need to re-implement that in order to get on top of the, the biofilm. Delayed healing despite optimal wound management and health support, low level chronic inflammation. Increased exudate and moisture in the wound with that low level erythema that we can see around the peri wound. Sometimes that granulation tissue just looks really poor or we have friable hypergranulation that's bleeding. And that's often an indication of biofilm as well, along with potentially secondary signs of infection. So what does this mean for treating wounds? Biofilms do have an increased tolerance to antimicrobials. Good debridement and cleansing is absolutely essential to disturb these biofilms in wounds and trying to prevent them from reforming. They can be quite um, cheeky little things and can be quite deep inside slough and necrotic tissue. So again, trying to remove that through whatever method of debridement is really important. So clean the wound really well. So this is um, a big plug of necrotic non-viable tissue I debrided from a person's sacral pressure injury. And it probably took me about 45 minutes to debride this piece of tissue away, but leaving that in the wound was such a huge risk to increase his level of systemic infection. So it's something I had to do at the time. So let's talk a little bit more about SAPs, superabsorbent polymers. So superabsorbent dressings, there's quite a few on the market. And as we know, Zetrivit Plus is probably the most common, certainly the one that I use a lot of the time because all absorb and retain fluids. It does reduce the risk of leakage. It's aiming to minimise macerations and they do lock exudate in and they can bind MMPs as well in the structure of their dressings. So uh, I'm just gonna move on there. So some other management strategies, certainly if the wound is too wet, we'll use a thicker, more absorbent sap dressing. Uh, we'll need to increase that frequency of dressing change. And look, if that still doesn't hold the exudate, the next step is really looking at negative pressure devices. Um, and that's certainly a valuable tool that we have um, in our basket that we can use to manage those really wet exuding wounds. Nothing else will do it if, from a dressing point of view. If it's too dry, looking at um, hydrogels or gel interface dressings that will actually promote some moisture in that wound environment and aid in wound healing. Certainly thinner, less absorbent products. And you know, often these can be left on for quite a period of time, up to seven days. So for that optimal level, 
continue with the current dressing and do as you are. The wound is healing beautifully. So just some examples there. You set your bit plus with your super absorber polymer beads in there. Too dry, something like HydroClean could be very beneficial, which has ringer solution and creates quite a rinsing effect to hydrate dry tissue in a wound. Or something uh, that will manage that moderate to heavy level of exudate, such as the proximal silicon foam or your Zetubit uh, plus silicon border. So this is just another good reference um, that Hartman have looking at moisture balance and choice of product that you might use depending on that level of exudate. So I have been through most of those there. Um, so there are some good resources available for you. So protecting the periwing skin, years ago when I started my nursing at the Alfred, I worked with an excellent stonewall therapy nurse and she was very big on protection of the periwing. So I've been using um, dimethicone-based barrier creams or wipes pretty much all of my 30 years of nursing. So it's something I'm very mindful of, particularly when we're talking about wound exudate and its detrimental effects on the periwing skin. So we do need to be mindful if it, there's moderate to heavy levels of exudate, and there are signs of infection, whether that's local spreading or systemic, that we are protecting the periwing. And certainly the dimethicone based is generally the most used. Um, most of those, when they're popped on the skin, on that periwing skin should dry and you're able to uh, put adhesive dressings on top. Some of the silicon foam dressings do stipulate not to use a barrier underneath as it can affect adhesion. So always check the product information with the product you're using. Uh, and certainly the presence of high exudates in your lower limb type wounds can cause a problem on the peri wound as well, decrease that wound size. So this is the model that I certainly try to work by, a person-centred holistic approach to wound care, because I always say to people, well, that wound's attached to you and therefore I need to know everything about you before I think about what we're going to do with the wound. So the, one of the first questions I do ask them is, what is your concerns? What is bothering you most about your wound and how is it impacting on you? Referring on, I certainly don't know everything and like to work within a multidisciplinary team, allied health, medical colleagues, et cetera, to try and get best outcomes for the person. Defining the etiology, is it documented accurately? Classifying the wound as acute or chronic, looking at some investigations that can help with this process, looking at systemic and local factors, assessing their pain, is it no susceptible or neuropathic? Local wound care, education, and potentially pressure redistribution if that's a component. So quality of life, you know, I often get quite disheartened when I'm, I'm seeing a patient and it, their wound and their wound exudate is having such a massive impact on their quality of life. You know, I had a gent who was coming into my clinic for quite some months who said, you know, I really just don't want to be here. I just want to, you know, I want to end things. And, you know, that's terrible to heal and from a clinician's perspective, quite distressing of how we can manage that. So certainly I contacted his GP and we're able to get on top of that, but it can be absolutely devastating for people who are dealing with chronic wounds. So asking the person, how is it impacting on them? How do you assess that? The relationship between patient and the clinician is really important. A patient's understanding of the wound, psychological impact and healing are all entwined. A structured validated tool will certainly assist and there's quite a few validated tools um, available out there, such as the Wound Quality of Life tool from 2014. And the Cardiff Wound Impact Schedule has been around for quite some time. Treatments such as compression therapy can be lifelong and have a significant impact on quality of life as well. So it's just a couple of case studies that I wanted to um, talk about with you of patients I see. I probably see these wet, leaky type legs every day when I'm, I'm seeing patients. Um, so trying to manage this, trying to get select the appropriate type of dressing. So I certainly look at the super absorber dressings uh, for legs like this. This is a lady who um, potentially won't tolerate more than one level of tubular compression. She won't elevate her legs. She doesn't ambulate much. She is resistant to daily care and only accepts care three times a week. So every time we go, I'm looking at dressings that are soaked like this, uh, which is it's a huge risk for her and a huge challenge. 
on the other end of the spectrum, wounds are extremely dry. And you can see with this heel here, you've got that dry crust around the edge um, that will delay wound healing, delay epithelial contraction. And again, that sacral pressure injury uh, with all of that fluid and that non-viable tissue there is going to have a huge impact on increased risk of infection and also comfort because being the sacrum, incontinence is a huge issue which can often contaminate the dressings on it uh, several times a day. And again, another lady, that whole inelastic compression bandage is just completely soaked. So that's where we were putting, uh, we changed to putting super absorbent pads underneath and more absorbent primary dressings as well. So I think we really need to think, what is your dressing really telling you? Taking the dressing off, examining it, asking the right questions are all just so, so important uh, for um, managing wound exudate. At the end of the day, we all try to do the best we can for our patients and this is certainly a happy patient. There's a list of references for you. Thank you, is there any questions? Um, I've got none at the moment, but uh, I'm sure they'll be coming through shortly. No problem. Hi, Melinda. Um, I actually have a question for you. Can you hear me? Can. Okay. Um, when you were talking about the exudate management strategies that you use, uh, something I was curious to know, when would you choose to use a silicon interface with a super absorber over just use your regular uh, Zegivit Plus, which we know is quite a high level of absorbency. Yeah, I find sometimes with the silicon interface, they won't cope with as much exudate. So it would yeah. be more than moderate to heavily exuding where I'd choose the silicon interface on a wound. Yeah. Whereas if it's really wet, I'd just go straight to my Zegivit Plus. Okay, thank you. And I think there's one question which may have just come in. Um, it says, they have one person on a dietary protein intake. And as we most know that most people, um, older people are eating very low protein diets. Um, they're just asking how, how much would you recommend to see an impact on wound healing? Um, perhaps it's not as simple as that. So I guess the question to me that they're asking, thank you, Sarah Tool, is, you know, what do you see when someone's on a nutrient supplement, the impact on the wound healing process? I've got a gent I'm thinking at the moment, he's uh, about 50 and he's got spina bifida and had a chronic surgical wound breakdown in his groin and he has quite um, unusual anatomy due to his deformities with his spina bifida. He was on arginine supplements in the past. When I saw him, we did change the dressing regime. Everything was just too wet, so we did go for more super absorbers. Uh, and he said to me, look, I have tried arginine in the past. It's been a while. This wound's just been stagnant for six months or so. It had been a long time. I said, well, how about we put you back on some arginine? He told me about his diet. He has a lot of takeaway. He doesn't do home cooking. Um, so I said, how about we try on some arginine again? We did. Oh my gosh, did I see a change? And we changed nothing. Well, besides more exudate management, we didn't change anything else. So yeah. I saw a huge yeah. improvement with him. But, you know, we're looking at yeah. 1.2 to 1.5 grams of protein per kilo when we're aiding, we're aiming to heal a wound. So just doing some bloods can be useful looking at that total protein in albumin as well. Are they deficient and how, you know, getting dietitian input also. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, another question that I've got which has come up here is what's your thoughts with using a hydrogel in promoting moist wound healing? I know um, from my personal experience, probably a lot of the primary care nurses that are out there watching this, uh, the hydrogels are used so commonly for that autolytic de uh, debridement. Um, what's your thoughts? Um, I rarely use a hydrogel because most mm -hmm. of the wounds I'm seeing are moderate to heavily exuding. Um, if I yep. do use a hydrogel, I generally use an enzyme algino gel because of its antimicrobial properties, and that can cope with a moderate tebbly amount of exudate. Um, very rare the, that I see a dry wound that I'm going to put a simple hydrogel on. Um, yep. Because if when I'm seeing a dry wound, it's normally an unstageable pressure injury on the heel, and we're not going to hydrate it. We let that scar remain stable. So I rarely use hydrogels in my practice. Yep. 
Yeah. So I think um, I think probably more where um, it would be used is in an acute wound. Um, just a lot of those quick ones that you want to just keep that little bit of moisture to that you Absolutely. do see quite commonly in the general practice yep. setting. Post, um, yeah, post-surgery for sure, or simple, well, yep. simple wounds, not complex wounds. Yep. Um, another question here is, can you clarify during uh, a wound swab procedure? Um, and the, I know that you answered this during the, um, the presentation is that, do we clean first? Yes, we do yeah. clean prior to yeah. it's that old, Absolutely. It's an old argument that we have, isn't it? That's been going on for many yeah. years, but yeah, Absolutely. it comes back down to best practice. Absolutely. So yeah. I always advise people to go to their local pathology service and ask for their wound swabbing protocol because that will be based yep. on the Levine method of swabbing. So if you Google Levine method, you'll find that where it talks about cleansing, removing non-viable tissue. And I say to people, you've got to tell the patient this is going to hurt a bit. So you need to get the swab, suppress it into the granulation tissue, not into slough or necrotic tissue. You want the fluid from the granulation tissue because then the microbes spreading beyond the wound margin causing your uh, spreading erythema. Um, the other document that does talk about the Levine method is the Wound Infection Institute document on infection that was released in March last year, and that goes through Levine yeah. also. And that's something that we've got on our reference list here too. Yep. Um, an interesting one, how would you know whether to keep the wound dry uh, with necrotic tissue or to Sorry, another question just came in and moved it out of the way for me. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess if we can talk about necrotic tissue, um, the best management for it, when would you know to hy uh, hydrate? It depends on the etiology. So if it's a black necrotic tissue because it's an unstageable pressure ulcer, as per our pressure injury guidelines, we do not hydrate. We keep it stable whilst it's there. If it's yep. a, a burn on a thigh from hot tea, then I'd certainly be wanting to hydrate it with a hydrogel. Absolutely. Yep. It depends on the etiology. Yeah. Yep. Um, an interesting one again is hypergranulation. Um, how would you manage mm. hypergranulation? We've got to work out the cause first. So there's two possible yep. causes of hypergranulation. One can be a malignancy, BCC or squamous cell or melanoma. The other can be hypergranulation due to that heavy exudate that hasn't been managed. You've got to be 100% comfortable that you've got the etiology right before you look at treatment. So if it's due to increase in exudate level and which you'll increase your bacterial load, I go for a hypertonic saline dressing with foam and pressure and that reduces hypergranulation beautifully, done daily for about seven to 10 days. If it's a malignancy though, you would never put a hypertonic saline dressing on because it will stimulate bleeding. So you do have yep. to be careful that you've got that etiology correct before you choose a dressing. Yeah. Um, just another, I'm just having a look. There's a lot of lot of thank yous and brilliance in here. Um, oh, nice. But yeah, we've talked about a lot of necrotic. Um, um, so what do you do for a simple skin tear? And um, how do you remove with frail thin skin? Do you use something other than water? So I think what they're talking about is the cleansing phase and just the general protocol that you would recommend, Melinda, in um, managing a skin tear. Mm, I guess it depends what category, whether you're 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B or 3. Um, but, you, you know, certainly when I'm teaching, and this is a personal uh, perspective that I teach, that for that first skin tear dressing change, the first nurse to do it or clinician to do it is so important because they need to try and approximate the flap. And given the fact that skin tears occur on a dirty surface, whether it's a fall, whether it's equipment, someone's nail, something's caused that skin tear, there's going to be a bacterial load. So I actually do recommend an antiseptic for the first dressing change only to reduce the bacterial load and reduce the risk of infection. Realign the flap with a moistened cotton tip because it's much more gentle than using forceps or anything else. And then a silicon foam. Yep. We um with Hartman we also have a trauma AG and that's something that we recommend with skin tears as well exactly as you said in that first phase anything that's at risk and prophylactically you can use a trauma AG because it does have a low level of silver um, when you say a silicon foam we have proximal that can be used um, and we also have the Zedivit plus silicon border with the sap which has that higher level of absorbency as well so yeah. I guess it sort of meets all of those things that we talk about. Um, and a lot of them, I think we've answered sorry. when we look at these questions. 
Um, we might just bring Jenny in if she'd like to come and wrap up, uh, just looking at the time and conscious. And also, if the questions weren't answered, we will um, get to them, so just to let you know. Yes, thank you uh, so much, Melinda. Uh, that was fantastic. And Georgina and Danielle, thank you for your contribution. Um, as I said earlier, this has been recorded and we will send the link out to everybody where you can access it in our library. I know there were a few people that had a few issues, so uh, don't worry, um, we will send you out the link. And we hope to be back with you next year and do some more webinars with Hartman's. All right, thank you so much, everybody, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank Don't you. Don't forget thank the you. evaluation. <laughs> yes. See you later. <laughs>